Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jason Klepa. Along with me today is Gabe Giannis, who's on the show regularly, in addition to Matt De La Valle. I still have my ESPN voice going. Uh, yeah, you do. Good. I know. Feeling good. Yeah, ever, ever since the games, that's exactly how he starts every episode. Is like, and then Jason. You know what's funny about that, dude? So I was in the car, and not to go, like, I was in the car, and I was like, in case Caden said something. And I was like, yeah, dude, that's a moment. And he just looks at me. He's like, Dad, I don't know what you mean. I was like, Bro, it's Sports Center. Like, you don't know that? And Sports Center top ten. Sports Center top ten. So, anyways, I just got done training the garage. I was hitting the bag tomorrow. I'm sparring for the first time in a while. Um, stand up. So I was, uh, I was g- brushing the cobwebs off, and I'm ready for an awesome conversation about uh, overcoming obstacles and uh, moving forward. So, thanks, guys. Who are you sparring I'm- with tomorrow? Dude, so yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot of questions. Well, I have too. a lot of questions about what's going on here. <laughs> so let's talk you know, about some fighting real quick. So you know, before I found CrossFit, I was actually uh, first introduced to Sancho, which is Chinese kickboxing, and then I was introduced to Muay Thai, which is obviously Thai kickboxing. And I did this while I was in college, and I really, I really loved it. And then I got out of college. And I still trained a lot. I sparred a lot. I never fought, but I sparred a lot. And uh, then I found CrossFit, and so I stopped doing it. Um, obviously, as of recently. I've been doing a lot of jujitsu and I've realized that my stand-up game, even though I worked it for several years, uh, just isn't where it needs to be. You know, my timing's off my, yeah, I can hit a bag, but dude, hitting a bag is a lot different than having somebody throw punches at you. So tomorrow I asked Benji, who's one of my training partners in jujitsu, if he would, you know, obviously like spar with me a little bit. And when I say spar, I mean, obviously it's a training session, so we're not trying to kill each other, but I want to just get the timing of just like pairing punches and, and stuff like that. So he's bringing my shin guards tomorrow. And uh, we're going to do some jujitsu and then spar a little bit. Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Hey, do you get nervous before any jujitsu training sessions anymore? Do you get nervous before like roles that you have with people who are more talented or a higher belt or somebody who's physically imposing? Does that still hit you? A little bit. So yesterday I went yeah. to the gym and I was rolling and uh, I walked in. There's probably like 15 people in there. There was a pretty big uh, brown belt that I know, a couple of good purple belts and a few, another brown belt and a black belt. And I get excited in those settings, like those excitement. Mm. I know I'm going to be able to actually like really work some dynamic stuff. So I get fired up from that environment. However, I do get nervous when I go over to Cow Terrace. So tomorrow mm. I'm going to Cow Terrace, I'm going to their comp class. And yes, I, I do get nervous about that because those guys are on another level. Um, and they're really, really good. Like they're going to put me in the red and I know it. So I bring like an extra gallon of water. I like I like drink a little bit of honey beforehand. Like I'm trying to like mentally and physically prep as much as possible. Whereas sometimes when I go regularly, I just like, like yesterday, for example, I hit a hard workout and then went right to jujitsu. I wouldn't do that when I'm at the comp class. Yeah. Yeah. Big difference. Big difference there for sure. Yeah. I mean, I used to, um, I'm looking forward to getting back on the mats at some point pretty soon. I've been off the mats uh, from jujitsu for, oh man, uh, probably close to a year now. Yeah, um, coming up on a year, haven't, haven't done any uh, jujitsu training due to the the hip injury. And um, looking forward to getting back out there. But I was just talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about how like, you know, when it becomes time to do those open mat roles or, you know, you look over and you see the person who, you know, is a little bit more physically imposing or higher belt or that person who, you know, is going to put you into the red, like you put it, like it starts to get a little bit nervous, man. The the belly starts to go a little bit. And it's good though, man. I mean, I do think that along my journey now, uh, I'm at a point where I've been rolling for so long that you know, it takes higher, higher belts to, to make me feel that way. But dude, I remember early on, I still feel that way today, but it makes you feel alive, dude. It makes you feel like, I don't know, maybe I'm just fired up after hitting the bag, but like, it just makes you feel alive. You know, like Mm -hmm. you're in this, you're in like the gauntlet and you're going to throw down with this guy and he wants to bring it and you want to bring it and you don't know what's going to happen. It's just different than CrossFit. It's just, it's a different beast. It's not better or worse. It's different. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, anybody, and you guys probably talk about jujitsu a ton on this podcast, or at least it gets mentioned a ton on this podcast, but no, for we, anybody we, out there, we really, like, we really don't. You guys as soon as the two it? of you get if I had it my way, <laughs> I, we'd be talking about it a lot more, but I know Gabe, Gabe, we shy away from it a little bit. But one of the things that's important, like, is if you're starting out or, um, you know, you're in the middle of the journey or wherever you're at in the journey is understanding that ability to like self-regulate your own intensity or to like, be honest and open with your training partners about where you're at or any injuries you might have or how hard you feel like you can go. And I think that's one of the things that like, you know, I I just turned 40 last weekend 
Shout and, out. Yeah, shout out. Um, I was just underwent a major surgery and my body's in a different place. My mind's in a little bit different place. And I think when I get back into jujitsu, I think I learned a lot of really good lessons early on, um, maybe the hard way, um, but now have a better understanding about like what my goals are in respect to that discipline, how I want to roll, who I want to roll with, why I want to roll with them and what I'm looking to get out of it, as opposed to just like purely going into the belly of the beast every single time you step on the mat. 100%, 100%, dude. I just want to, yeah. just a quick note on that. Like my birthday's in like two weeks. And uh, I put this post up a while ago, but I just want to make sure I acknowledge it here on the podcast, especially with MDV. If you're not watching this on video, MDV is a very handsome, very fit individual. And I'm looking forward to him thriving over the next, you know, however many years. But I was saying like, dude, I'm 37 right now. I'm turning 38. And I feel like I'm just getting started. Like I I, I really feel that way. And I, I'm not just saying this to boast, like I, I feel this way. Like it's a blend of being old enough where I've had all these life experiences, but young enough where I feel like super hungry and inspired to go out and go do really good stuff. And I feel like if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably in that range of 30 to 52. And I feel like we should all be thinking that same thing. So 52, very specific. Well, 50 also. Oh, okay. Oh, 52, 52, 52, 52. 52. Yeah, 52 yeah, yeah. T-O-O, gotcha. You can't work for NC Fit and not know when Jason Kalipa's birthday is, by the way. It's impossible. Oh, yeah. You will know when Jason Kalipa's <laughs> birthday is. Absolutely. All major deliverables. All do major on Jason's deadlines. Birthday. Everything has to launch prior or on the birthday. That's one we of my early it. lessons in my five years at NC so Fit. So funny. Dude, we've tried to launch stuff and it just hasn't happened. But uh, because it's a completely arbitrary deadline. It's 100%. the best. It's the birthday deadline. But it's going to, anyways, this, this year it's going to be good. But, uh, I do want to get into one of the topics we were discussing, you know, over the years, um, I think everybody kind of goes through trials and tribulations and, 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 and moments of adversity, right? Those moments could happen through competition. Those moments could happen on a macro scale, you know, huge, whatever. And I think for MDV, what's been interesting for me to watch is that he's had overcome adversity on a daily basis from the pain that he was exposed to with his hip. And, you know, I want to talk on today's podcast about this because I think there's going to be some people out there listening who are maybe going through a similar struggle. And what I would say is that if it's impacting your quality of life, especially if you're at a young age, like MDV or others are, I, I really think you have a duty to do the best you can to remove that because you don't know how it's impacted the rest of life. And I'll let MDV talk about that. But one, one thing to note is that what I think is admirable about what MDV did, obviously he, he, he got to a point where he needed a hip surgery, which we'll talk about, but before you go down the surgery route, I thought what was smart and, and MDV, I'm curious your thoughts. Did you wait a little bit too long, but you exhausted all options before surgery. And mm. I think what was cool about you doing that is that once you get surgery, dude, there's no coming back, right? Like you're getting surgery and they're, they're cutting into the limb, et cetera. But I think what you did is you earned that confidence that if the surgery went well or didn't go well, right. You at least knew that you had exhausted every other option before going for that. And I think that was a really good takeaway that I saw from the outside. So where should well, we I appreciate start? that. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where should we start guys? Yeah. Maybe we, maybe start with a little bit of a disclaimer here that these are just going to be my, uh, my personal feelings. That's, that's and a my lawyer personal, MDV coming, to, yeah. coming to the table. My personal anecdotes about dealing with this injury for so long and going through a total hip replacement, um, right before my 40th birthday. So, uh, um, exactly, almost exactly five weeks post-op today, which is Really pretty incredible to, to think about what goes into a uh, total hip replacement. Uh, I had an anterior total hip replacement on my right side. Uh, the diagnosis was that I had um, arthritis, advancing arthritis in that hip. Uh, I have a condition called FAI, which is femoral acetabular impingement, which is a congenital condition, which means that the shape of my femur heads are just a little bit different than like a normal anatomical shape that they fit a little bit differently into the hip socket and that certain activities or a lot of activity or certain compensations can cause some of the cartilage in that joint to wear down sooner than later. And that happens for some people and it doesn't happen for others. I also had things called cam lesions and a torn labrum and uh, bone spurring all in the right hip and the left hip is for all intents and purposes, very, very healthy or was very healthy in comparison to the right. And um, one of the most interesting parts about this entire injury, especially when I got to understanding like what was going on a little bit more. And this is one of the harder things is that people can have my exact um, diagnosis or they can have my exact MRI, x-rays, all that kind of stuff. And they can have no symptoms 
whatsoever. They could have um, all those things going on and not really have any symptoms associated with it or have very mild symptoms or have intermittent symptoms. And over the course of like two years, two and a half years, maybe, and that's probably when it started like two and a half years ago, I started feeling just a pulling in the front of my right hip. And I'm not trying to say this to scare anybody. I'm not trying to say this to put anybody on their heels about like, oh man, I got to go get like my hips checked out and maybe I need hip surgery. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but like, I'm just going to relay what happened to me. And uh, at the time I was training really hard. I was doing jujitsu. I was doing a lot of weighted walking. And I just felt like my hip flexors were really tight. That's the only thing that felt like it was quote unquote wrong. I didn't have any other symptoms. I had full range of motion. I was just getting an intermittent pulling in the front of my hip. And if I have, you know, complete honesty, or if my hindsight is completely 2020, maybe I go back to that moment and I say, I'm going to stop all activity. I'm going to stop all um, external loading. I'm going to chill on jujitsu. I'm going to try to figure out what this is before, you know, adding any more inputs into the equation. Well, just a quick pause there for a second. Mm. Do you think if you had done that, it would have changed the outcome? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, you know, there, there are some people out there who subscribe to belief that like, you know, you can kind of reverse some of this stuff. Um, but there's also a large part of the community that says, once you don't have any cartilage anymore, once, once there's a, a complete loss of cartilage between the joint and the capsule, uh, or the head of the femur that you can't regrow that, or at least the process to regrow it would be extremely, extremely long that like it kind of, once you have bone on bone in your joint, that that might mean that uh, a replacement is the best option. And again, this is just the information that got relayed to me and the things that I've learned over the course of the couple of years of dealing with this injury. And I did, like Jason said, I did everything, everything under the sun to avoid surgery. Um, I tried rest. I mean, rest in, in comparison to like what I believed was rest. I was still moving. I was still training, but I, 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 calmed a lot of things down. I didn't train the way that I was training. I took the loading way down. I tried things like joint mobilizations, PT, massage. I got injections. Um, I think the one the one more um, kind of popular route now that a lot of people are pursuing that I didn't end up pursuing was stem cells. I didn't go right. down the route of um, the stem cell related therapy, but I did do PRP, which is platelet rich plasma. Um, and stem cells for me was <clears throat> not that I don't believe in it. I think that obviously people have had success utilizing that therapy. And I did explore talking to experts in that field, um, you know, pr pretty deeply, but it was, it, it's a big commitment um, money wise. And, and it's not necessarily guaranteed that that treatment will resolve what's going on, at least for what I had. And I did a lot of talking to people who had had joint replacements and um, in particular with the type of joint replacement that I had, uh, anterior um, hip replacement, I was pretty confident that the that route would be best for me in terms of getting back to um, normal activity, pain-free life, and being able to do the things that I wanted to do on the best timeline with the best long-term outcome. And that was the decision that was just ended up being best for me. The tough part is that like a lot of the the literature and the research and the stuff that's out there for hip replacements really isn't aimed at people like me. They, they talk a lot about it, you know, beyond the age of 50 or 55. They talk a lot about it from a, like a more sedentary lifestyle. Um, but I was fortunate enough to converse with a bunch of people in the space, you know, a high level jujitsu player. Uh, he was really, really helpful for me. He's had uh, two hip replacements. I talked to a high level power lifter. He had his first hip replacement about five or six months before me. And he's having a second one um, in November. And these people are all around my age range and all do things that express their fitness similarly to how I want to express my fitness. And talking to them um, gave me a lot of confidence that this might be the best route for me. But I still had to go through a process of, um, you know, thinking about it and it's hard when <clears throat> the injury isn't linear. Like it's not one of the challenging parts about this injury that across the two years or two and a half years, there were ups and downs. There were times when I was going and training with UJ and I was feeling really good. You know, I, 
maybe pop a couple of anti-inflammatories and go roll jujitsu and, and felt pretty darn good. Um, or, you know, I would take a couple of weeks and I'd slow things down and feel pretty good and maybe do something and it would set me back. Um, but it did get to the point at the end of the journey when I was getting pretty close to my surgery date that um, I wasn't able to to function or really walk um, in, in any way that was commensurate with a lifestyle that I wanted to lead. Not even a lifestyle that was like remotely close to a fit and active lifestyle. I mean, like supporting myself on furniture as I'm moving around my apartment. And that was untenable for me for the type of life that I wanted to live. It was like at that point, I knew taking a more drastic approach to resolving this was the point at which I had to, to go um, and get the procedure done. I want to I want to dive into one thing you said a little bit more and this might not specifically apply to your circumstance or mm -hmm. your injury but I think it's worth talking about and it's when you were mentioning trying everything exhausting all resources and what rest really meant and doing a little bit less loading you know pulling off the the gas pedal a little bit but you know in my experience and actually there's there's a funny story here your good friend, James Hobart, he was the first one that I heard, like mention something that now to me seems really obvious, but at the time just seemed like, well, why would I do that? And it was, there was a, a member at CrossFit Garden City back in the day, really injured back. Like she was dealing with a lot of pain and he was there just happened to be coaching a level one or teaching a level one. And they were kind of talking about her injury. And she kept saying how, you know, she's trying to rest it. And he asked her, he was like, you know, what have you been, you know, what does rest look like to you? And she's like, you know, like take two days off. And he's like, dude, like yeah. you need to like, at least for a month, lay off of it and like, see how that responds and then go from there. Like, I think that there is this skewed perception of what rest looks like for a lot of people in this community where fitness is such a big part of our identity. Like for us working out is brushing our teeth, right? Like we do it every single day. And I don't know what I would do if I couldn't go out there and get after it at least five days a week. So for us, you know, resting is, Hey, I'm going to take three, four consecutive days off. Like that's crazy. That means that I like took some serious rest and it so feels like forever, I'm, you know, like, right. It feels <laughs> like forever. And like, to your point, you might feel a little better, but then what happens day five, you go after it and you like, you're so excited to be back that you like really get after it. Mm. So I guess the question is like now in retrospect, do you feel like that was something that you could have handled a little bit differently and really tried like actual rest, like to say, Hey, I really exhausted all opportunities. Like I, I, I didn't do anything on this hip for like a month and a half mm. and see how it went. And then when I came back that day after a month and a half, I also wasn't like super excited and went gung ho, but I came back and went like, you know, not too much too soon. And even if you don't think that maybe that pertains specifically to your circumstance, do you think that that's something that does trip up people and they end up dealing with something just like, like you said, not linear, but is it not linear because it's not linear or is it not linear because you never got past the threshold of how long you should rest for it to actually start getting better? Of telling, not knowing. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. So I can't speak on what I didn't do and how it might impact, how it might have impacted my situation. Um, what I do know is that everybody's body is a little bit different. Um, and everybody responds differently to different types of therapies and different types of stimulus and certainly different types of rest. And when we're talking about injuries, um, you know, chronic injuries or acute injuries, but like, let's keep the conversation a little bit more angled towards like the, the chronic injury that I had, um, in particular versus a back injury or a disc injury. Um, I think joint injuries are, are, um, a little bit categorically different. Um, I th at least my understanding of, of disc injuries is that the way that discs respond to certain types of treatment or therapy or rest is different than how cartilage might respond in a joint. And I'm again, I'm not a doctor. Uh, this is just from my personal experience. This is just from, you know, talking to multiple, multiple experts. Um, and basically everybody who was in the traditional, I'm going to say like Western medicine camp, most of them if not all of them said that the cartilage that was gone in my hip was gone 
and that it's not going to regrow with rest that like right. you're not right. getting cartilage back do i know that that's a fact do i know that if i took a year off or 6 months off would i have been able to perhaps have some sort of relief from that that pain that was kind of incessant um cuz the pain across the two and a half years for me was was pretty consistent um there were certainly days when i had less pain um and i don't know whether or not i would attribute that to having just more space in the joint and not having the femur and uh the, you know the hip uh, capsule uh rubbing against one another in in such a, a aggressive way or whether or not did i take a few days extra rest during those times and i just felt like you know all the muscles the tendons the ligaments and everything around it kind of felt better it's really really hard to know i don't have you know, x-ray vision, MRI vision. It's like almost an impossible um, uh, question to answer. What I can tell you is that I didn't take six months worth of complete rest where all I did was walk uh, or all I did was my daily life activities. Uh, I definitely was doing some sort of movement or some sort of training most of the time. And uh, a lot of it was avoidance training, like avoiding things that would hurt or, or I thought would hurt or irritate the hip. Um, you know, I stopped doing uh, as much uh, full range of motion squatting. I definitely wasn't doing that as much. I still experimented with some of it on some days when I felt pretty good. Um, but yeah, a lot of my training had changed over the course of those two years. And then, like I said, I, you know, I stopped doing jujitsu for a full year um, because every time I touched the mats, I would go home and I would be in, in pain. Um, so there was some stuff that I had to like really dive into personally about like uh, how I was framing my life and the identity that I had as, as somebody who was fit and active. And, you know, I always, always looked at myself as the guy who was like, if we're going to go play spike ball on the beach. I want to fucking die for points playing spike ball. Like I want to have a lot of fun running around in the sand. I want to dive. I want to run. I want to play. Like I want to do all that kind of stuff. And what happened during this injury was like, I question and even during the recovery period right now, and we can get into talking about recovery, but during the time that I was injured and didn't have any sort of um, definitive step towards healing, didn't have the surgery yet. I would question every single movement that I made. I was always thinking about, am I, if I make this movement right now, how is my hip going to feel? Or if I do this thing right now, how is my hip going to feel? Or, you know, if I, um, if I ride, uh, this bike right now and I, you know, go a little bit harder is, am I going to be sore later on? It was really, really challenging to tell what things would, um, impact the hips negatively to the point where I was, um, further behind the eight ball versus not. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of success defining like, oh, these things over here are the things that I can do. And I know they won't irritate me. Um, well, let me ask you this question on that, right? So sure. you've been a fit guy forever and fitness is a part of my identity, Gabe's identity, your identity, um, to be able to go train hard, live free, to be able to do physical activities. Like that's just like a, a non-negotiable for me. And I want to be able to go play with Caden. I want to be able to go you know, work out with Ava in the morning, whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, because of, and I, I think this is something that is interesting to hear your perspective on because, you know, hopefully this is the last time that your fitness is inhibited like this, but it might not be. How does it change your perspective? And I think what lessons did you learn along this journey? Because from a high level, right? Maybe many people listening are not going to have a hip injury. Maybe they will, right? But people will go through times in their life where, they're not physically as capable as they were in other times for whatever reason that is. So your identity was, or at least I'll speak for myself, is so tied up with your fitness because it's something that you do for work. It's something you do. How did your perspective shift on that? What lessons did you learn along that journey? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think I certainly was a hard charger in fitness for a large portion of my life. You know, there were periods of time in my CrossFit career where I really wanted to trained very, very hard where I had competitive aspirations. I was never at the level that you were at Jason, but like certainly stepped out on the competition floor a bunch. Um, and you know, one of the interesting parts about, you know, this injury was during that time period, uh, of like two and a half years ago or two years ago till now, most of my perspective on fitness had already shifted to, to just being things that I wanted to do because I enjoyed doing them or leveled up into a type of goal for my, 
for my body or for my life that I wanted to realize, you know, whether or not I wanted to be lean and fit and athletic and generally capable. Um, I didn't really have aspirations in my more kind of recent years, you know, 35 on of being somebody who was a, a competitive fitness athlete. You know, I wanted to do jujitsu. I wanted to continue the pursuit of, you know, earning all of my, um, my stripes, you know, uh, figuratively and literally, literally in that sense, like I wanted to be on the mats and I wanted to explore that discipline. Uh, and I used training as something that like, yeah, I had certain aesthetic goals and I want to look good naked and I want to be functional and fit and capable, but I also, I really enjoy working out. I enjoy, uh, getting into whether it's the gym or the garage or whatever and, and training and enjoy training hard. Um, but I, I, I never really had that mindset. Like, like I was training hard for something in particular, aside from just training hard for my own life and my own goals. I can say that as I've gotten, you know, closer to where I am right now, and certainly when I've had the surgery, how I look at fitness now is certainly a little bit different, even from where I just described, where I'm, I'm really interested in doing what my body kind of tells me it needs and wants to do. Um, and much more interested in longevity and how I'm approaching my training and infusing things uh, into my training that for many, many years I, I neglected. And I, I don't think that I'm like the only person <laughs> in the functional training space or the space that we play in who neglected things like mobility and stretching and all those types of things. Like I, I, I just didn't do them enough. I didn't do them as often as I should have. They're not the sexiest parts of training. You know, they sometimes quote unquote, take away from the actual like grind that you're going to get after in the gym. And if you're looking at a set amount of time, you're saying, I only got 60 minutes to work out today. Maybe you're not taking the 15 minutes up front and the 15 minutes in the back and not warming up and cooling down properly. I think we've all been there, but one of the things I've come to realize is that like, those are indispensable elements of not only my training, but my life and how I want my body and my mind to feel. And one of the things that I've really dove into is um, tissue work and stretching much more diligently now than I ever have in the past. And the, um, the gains, the quote unquote gains that you get from that, they come rather slowly. They don't come as fast as like um, even, you know, gains like in cardio, fitness, yeah. yeah, your cardio right. gains or whatever, right. like, um, but through that journey and setting dedicated time aside and, and stretching and diving into um, not only like your body, but like your, your mind. And I know it sounds a little bit woo woo when you're starting to get into this kind of stuff, but there's certainly. It's like I was saying connect with, you know, I, was, I was training these guys today. I was like, I was like, dude, I want you to be strong. I want you to connect with your lat when you're doing the pull up. And guys are looking at me like, nah, bro, like mentally, physically, like connect with your body. Anyways. Oh yeah, dude. It, it's a, it's a really deep, um, it's a really deep journey. And I think it goes much deeper for me, at least than the intensity journey that like I had through things like CrossFit and jujitsu. I think that, you know, when you're doing those things that are hyper intense, a lot of times my mind is kind of shut off except for exactly what I'm doing at that time. And like, I'm in the workout, I'm in the role or whatever. And, you know, there's a, there's a certain presence there. One of the things with stretching is that like, I feel the presence is very, very different. I'm able to be completely present in the stretch, but I'm also diving into things like very deeply into my own like mind and my body. Uh -huh. And, you know, you have time like a there. meditation state. For sure, for sure. And it's been something that's been really, really helpful for me and um, has become an indispensable practice now where like I wake up almost every day now and I stretch at least for 20 minutes. And if I don't get it done right in the morning, I'm doing it sometime before like my first, um, like the middle of the day. And then at the end of the day as well, finding time to, you know, really just fuck, like, one of the things I realized is like, there's time for this stuff. It just might not be as comfortable as what you're doing at the moment where you're laying on the couch or you're sitting on the couch and you're watching your show. It's like, dude, you can move the couch out of the way or roll out your mat and get down on the ground for 20 or 30 minutes and stretch. It's just whether or not you have the discipline to do that because it's not fun all the time. And when you first get started, it's very uncomfortable and you don't really want to do it. And then you realize that like, you know, a couple of weeks go by that you haven't done it and it just becomes easy not to do it. Um, but certainly like those decisions for me, and this is something like getting, not to get too far off topic, but one of the, th one of the quotes that I wrote down, like as I was going through this injury 
forget when I wrote it down, but it was make the decisions you know you need to make to feel the way you know you want to feel. And that gave me extreme control and power over like all these little decisions, all these little micro decisions. Like, is this meal? Is this a uh, drink? Is this thing? Is this discipline? Are all those things leveling up into where I want to go with my body and my mind, which is a much more healed place than I had come from. Make the decisions today to make, to, can you say that one more time? I'm going to write down. Yeah. Make the coffee decision. Co coffee with Kalipa incoming. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Make, the, make the decisions you know you need to make to feel the way you know you want to feel. Um, and, you know, fun? I think that <laughs> that's by me. Um, Jason Kalipa. Oh, but no, that's, you, that's, that's by you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, oh. I mean, it's completely derivative of stoic philosophy, right? It's, sure. I mean, it's, it's fucking focus on what you can control and you can control your mindsets, your actions and your reactions. And one of the things that, you know, I know we wanted to talk about today in dealing with injuries is like this whole shadow life that can happen when you get to a part of your journey where you are faced with adversity. And it, it has given me a lot of perspective as to why people might choose certain routes or why people might gravitate towards certain vices when an aspect of their life that they relied on has shut down. Let's say fitness was a really strong outlet for you as a human being, that, that this is the place that you, you know, get out a lot of your stress and your anxiety, and it's something that you love to do. And now that's taken away. And maybe by default, other aspects of your physicality, whether or not that means you can walk or you're not in pain or like, Hey, I move a certain way. And all of a sudden I feel like shit. If that also is going on in your life, you know, there, there's definitely, um, decisions that come, come across you where you go, do I want to go and take some pills or do I not want to go take some pills? Do I want to sit here and lay on the couch and eat like shit? Or do I not want to lay on the couch and eat like shit? And it's, it's really an interesting perspective to have now that I was in that place, actually in that place, because this is the real first major injury that I, I mean, I dealt with a back injury at some point earlier on in my career that kind of resolved, or that did resolve um, through rest and all that kind of stuff. But um, this was a, a big one for me. And I, there's certainly moments that I had that like, I made decisions that I wasn't proud of, or like, you know, certainly made decisions that took me away from how I wanted to feel. And it, it was easier for me to see how somebody who was in that kind of place, when you're dealing with that kind of pain, or you don't have the same outlets that you have, that you can very easily reach for the things that are vices and take yourself further away from where you want to go, but in a, in a way that is giving you a lot of comfort in the present. Like you're getting comfort, you're getting some sort of serotonin dump, you're getting some sort of like real high, whether or not that's a uh, actual high or a high off of uh, whatever that allows you to escape from what you're feeling. Yeah. And it's almost like you, you feel like you're, um, enabled by that. Right. So let's just say someone's in a lot of pain and they choose to go take painkillers and whatnot and whatnot, you know, it kind of goes down a path, but it's like their behavior is almost justified because they're telling themselves, Hey, I'm in this, I'm in this position. So I get what you're saying. Like, you're saying make the decisions you know you need to make today to feel the way you want to feel in the future it, tomorrow. Or and, dude, I I love that man. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's a really good it's a really good way to like guide people away from the instant gratification and yeah. be able to do the thing that has delayed gratification. Because going to what MDB was just saying, like the reason that high intensity training is so great and <clears throat> a lot of people run towards it is because you get instant gratification. You get the instant dopamine high, you throw up your score on the leaderboard, you're seeing progress, seeing PRs. Like it's all like input output immediately. The problem with, and this also applies to nutrition. The reason why nutrition is a harder sell. The reason why mobility is a harder sell is because you're not going to eat one healthy meal and lose some weight. You're not going to do one 20 minute stretching session and be like, wow, my hips are so much more mobile. And, but like to what MDV was saying, like, if you do think about like, Hey, is this an action that's going to get me closer to feeling how I want to feel. And you take away the timeline of it. You just do it in, Hey, this is contributing maybe 1% because a lot of this stuff is a 1% decision, less than 1%, honestly, 
but you still use that guiding principle, you'll do the thing as opposed to how I think a lot of people. And honestly, me in the past, I'm sure you guys in the past have made decisions, which is, am I going to get like an instant, you know, benefit mm. from this versus yeah. like years from now, months from now, whatever it is. Dude, I have yeah. my leg up on this stool right now just because of you, MDV. You're motivating. <laughs> yeah, just stretching right now. Nice. Stretch right now. Um, you know, and, and I don't want to sound like somebody who's telling you to live your life with your fanny pack on and your, you know, your raisins and your, you know, turkey in there and and your nuts and seeds and stuff like that. And like that's what you do when you go to a party. But like I think at least being conscious about the decisions that you're making and understanding, like, okay, like. I am, for the most part, making most of the decisions to bring me towards this end state of how I want to feel. And then if you're not making those decisions, like understanding that like it's going to delay this long-term goal that you're going to have, maybe a, a small amount, maybe a big amount, depending like the variance that you're having um, of the decisions that you're making. Like, I do believe like a big part of all of this is making sure that like you're aligned to what that end goal is and understanding that like you do have opportunities every single day to bring you a little bit closer or a little bit further away. And there is a certain amount of temptation for sure. When you're injured, you're hurt, you're, you're seeking comfort, you're seeking some sort of relief from that pain. And a lot of things look really tempting. You know, like I'm not going to tell anybody not to take anything that they're supposed to take. Like your doctor tells you to take it. You should listen to your doctor. You should talk to your doctor. You should, you know, understand the pros and the cons of it and make the decision for yourself. But like, I think that there's also um, ways that we can frame these kinds of things to, to better understand like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be eating pizza every night right now just because it feels good and I can't train. So like, what's the point? What's the point of you know, eating uh, the way that I, I want to eat or the way that I, I think I want to eat if I'm not training, you know? Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I want to the question. For the, the, be, right. Before we get there, though, like this, what's the point mentality is where a lot of people really fall into the slippery slope as we head to the end of the year, because mm. it might not be injury related, but you're going to be traveling, not going to have as much time. You have like the holiday party at work. Then you have this other work and it's very easy to be like, what's the point? Wait till January. And while it doesn't tie, like, you know, I'm injured. I can't work out. It is going to be a little tougher to do the right things here in the last quarter of the year. And the worst thing you can do is the, what's the point mentality of then taking the things that are in your control and also just like disregarding those because there are some things that are out of your control that are going to get a little tougher because they are, they are for everyone, me included. And yeah, I, I just think that that definitely that's a really, as well. That's a really good point, Gabe. I, I want to touch base on something real quick because it seems like you're having a perspective shift through the journey. Um, we had John McCaskill on the podcast. He was talking about box breathing. And in particular, he was talking about how through this meditation work, he was able to open his mind a little bit. So when he went to therapy and whatnot, he was in a better place where he was unlocking stuff through meditation. And what, what that opens my mind hearing from you and just talking about your long-term, what I'm hearing as you talk is that you seem to have a more acute awareness of what your end goal is in terms of how you want to feel. And I'm understanding that as partly because of your time doing stretching is also meditation. Is it, are you incorporating, like, are you actively while you're utilizing these stretch sessions, like actually looking at it more as also a little bit of meditation and deep reflection on where you want to go? And how is that all working? Because it, it sounds different than what I've heard in the past, you know, years ago, et cetera. So I want to kind of dive in a little bit more on that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that some of this stuff is combined in a, in a much bigger personal, personal right. growth path than, um, than just injury related. You know, I think that Everybody has history. Everybody has things that, you know, they were born with or situations that they lived through. And, you know, I'm not saying that I had the toughest road to hoe, but, you know, there's certainly things that, you know, I went through or things I handled wrong or ways that I approached certain situations that I'm not proud of. Um, and also better understanding like my whole life as um, whether or not like, uh, am I going to have this layer of stress? that overlays everything that I do always, or whether or not can I figure out a way 
to get out from under that and live more freely and fully between the ears. Because I think that that's a huge, a huge, huge thing for, at least it was for me, um, that like, you know, there were things in my life that were hanging over my head for a long time that probably had, um, exerted a lot of stress or strain on me, not, notwithstanding, um, things like student debt, notwithstanding like, uh, relationships with family members, um, all those kinds of things, personal reflection about like who I am, what I want to do, what I want to bring to certain situations. And I think that the injury allowed me the opportunity to slow some things down in my life and reflect on how I wanted to grow, what version of me did I want to show up as, and then also tapping into resources like therapy or tapping into resources like meditation or breathing and stretching, um, and uh, not resources per se, but practices. And I do, um, I, I don't have a formal breathing practice, but I do practice box breathing. I'll practice it during stretching. Um, I know that other people have much more kind of, uh, disciplined, uh, practices around it. I don't necessarily, I will also tell you that like I have utilized CBD as something that's been helpful for me in particular. Um, I found that, um, when I incorporate some CBD plus some of the stretching that it allows me to get deeper into not only my body and my mind a little bit. Um, and it, that's been really insightful for me. Uh, it's, it's opened up a layer of empathy that. Uh, maybe I wasn't able to tap into prior and it's still a, it's still a, like a work in progress. It's still thing that still stuff that I have to reflect on, on a daily basis to see whether or not I'm still on track with those certain types of goals or perspectives that I want to have, because ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old now. So I'm kind of like halfway through the ride. And, um, do I want to have a next 40 years, you know, knock on wood, I, hopefully I do. But I want to have the next 40 years that might have incorporated some of the learnings and the lessons that uh, I was able to glean from maybe my first 40 years and having to teach myself some things or having to learn some things or go out and find tools and resources that maybe I wasn't armed with earlier or maybe I refused to look at earlier. Um, so it has it has been a big paradigm shift for me, um, not only in terms of like my fitness and my training, but like also just how I want to approach life in general. And um, it's not something that like I'm saying I'm perfect at because I'm certainly not. And I certainly still make bad decisions. I certainly still fuck up. I say the wrong things. I don't always make the right decisions for myself, but it's at least given me the understanding that like, hey, I I do have a lot of control over these things. And I control in large part about how I feel and how I react to things almost exclusively, not in large part, exclusively. I have control over that. And do I want to show up like this version or do I want to choose to show up like this version? And um, I think that's been really helpful for me. And it's been, it's been helpful also in in managing like the stress of the injury Um, because, you know, I think being in chronic pain, like I was, you know, every single step at some level, across those years had pain, you know, whether or not it was a two on the scale that day or eight or nine on the scale that day was still pain. So every time you stride, you're experiencing pain. And, um, one of the coolest parts about surgery, at least in my experience and, and coming out of it in five weeks later, I'm not completely pain-free now. Like I still have, I get, uh, sore, like my blow back gets sore, my knee gets sore, but, um, all the arthritic pain from my hip is gone, gone, which is amazing. Um, but one of the things was like the full body stress and inflammation that I started to feel, uh, or I felt, uh, towards, especially towards the end, like the last like year, just always feeling like, oh man, something's wrong. Always feeling like, you know, a bit inflamed, you know, my, my skin condition, my psoriasis acting up a little bit more because of this inflammation. My psoriasis has like completely resolved, um, the total body inflammation, like the whole, just the, the weight that I feel on an everyday basis has, has, re, has gone down for sure. And now I'm like in a place where I feel really good about understanding, like, these are the steps that I can take now to hopefully get back to at least like full function or very, very close to full function and a pain-free life and being, um, like unflinchingly committed to that. 
and and not going too hard, too soon, too fast, you know, being five weeks out and starting to feel good. But like understanding, hey, I got to rest. I got to step back a little bit. I got to prioritize my PT. My nutrition needs to be on point. All those kinds of things have really helped me a lot. You know, it's, it's really cool, man, to hear what like feels like the majority of the conversation be about all the positives that came out of this. Um, and it reminds me of this thing that I, I heard Chris Williamson talk about in, in a couple of podcasts that I think is, is super interesting when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. And it's this region beta paradox. Have you guys heard of it? No. So I'll, I'll try not to butcher the explanation, but essentially it's, if you imagine that you had this rule where anything that's a mile or less, you'll walk and anything that's two miles or more, you'll drive. So the paradox is that you'll actually get two miles down the road faster than you would one. And the whole idea is this idea that like a lot of people kind of live in this, like it's not an ideal situation, but it's not bad enough to like prompt action. Mm. And so they stay in this like beta area where they're not happy, but they're comfortable enough where they don't have to do the thing that would actually take them out of a really shitty situation and make it an even better situation than this like region in the middle that like sucks but isn't bad enough to spark action. And while I think that obviously, and you would agree to this, you know, this hip surgery and the hip injury has been a shitty situation for you. I think that the fact that you're so focused, or it seems like you're so focused in the fact that it's prompted all of this action that's actually put you in like a net positive of where you were before, I think is a cool example of that. Because, yeah, I, you know, had it been going. something that like was painful, but not terribly painful, just kind of like painful, you know? Would you have gone so much longer being okay with it, not stretching, not finding all these like amazing benefits to the mindfulness aspect of it, so on and so forth, and just spent, you know, say another five years of your life, you know, with like a three out of 10 pain and just like, just not being happy with where you are. Obviously, you know, the best is to not have the injury overall, but it's cool to hear you be so focused on the fact that like, you know, net, net there's been a lot of positive that's come out of this. I a hundred percent net net positive. And I can't change the fact that I had this injury happen. Like there's, I, there's no amount of wishing that I can do about the past and go, Oh, I wish that this didn't happen. And I wish that I was, you know, two and a half years of pain free. And, you know, I'd be where I am now. I don't know. I mean, if I, if I, if you go back and you say, Hey, if I could change the past two and a half years and not go through the types of things that I went through. And I really tried. And this was one thing that I, I hope that you guys recognize is that I really tried not to let the hip pain impact me in a way that was like overtly negative or like I tried not to always be complaining about it. I tried not to be like, oh man, like this sucks. This is the worst thing ever. Like I tried really, really hard and it took a lot of effort. It took effort because there are fucking, there's certainly days, man. I woke up and I was like, man, this sucks. I do not want to get out of bed today. I am feeling like shit. This is terrible. I can't believe I'm dealing with this, but I tried to snap myself out of those fast, fast because like it, it wasn't changing my situation at all. Yeah. Like no right. matter how shitty I would describe the situation as it was still the situation. So I tried to do the best things that I could do for myself and the injury. I tried to change my outlook and my perspective a little bit. And I don't really char characterize the injury as being like a, a bad thing or a shitty thing. Like it, it happened. And like, of course, I don't wish injury on myself or anybody, but like I was, I, I, I hope that I was able to at least come out the other side better because of it. And I really probably wouldn't change where I am right now. And if somebody said, Hey, you got to go back two and a half years ago and you got to say, would, would you want this to happen or not? Fuck no, I wouldn't because there's a lot of really good stuff that's going on right now in my personal life, in my health, in my fitness, in my journey between the ears and all that kind of stuff that has um, changed me, I think for the better. And it would, it helped. It also helped me make decisions because like I was saying, like there was stuff that was looming over my head for many, many years that I was just avoiding, avoiding at all costs. And some of this stuff put that in perspective. Be like, dude, why do I want? Why do I want this other thing over here hanging over my head like this? Like, just make the decision and be done with it. Stop agonizing over it. Stop thinking about it every day. Stop letting this thing define you. Just make the decision and move forward. And that 
the injury and the situation that I was in with that really helped me because like, I didn't have unlimited bandwidth to worry about all these other things anymore. It's like, I need to be pretty myopically focused on this thing right now that's impacting me so much. So, I mean, knock on wood, I, like I said, five weeks post-op, um, I'm having a really um, pretty swift recovery so far. I got to keep into perspective that like, I, I can't push myself you know, past where I, I think I can go right now. Like this is a three, six, eight month kind of timeline to get back to, um, you know, close to full activity. Um, but it does feel really good to make the surgery decision and to have positive outcomes almost immediately afterwards. The first three days, first four, four days were really, really challenging. I mean, you wake up from surgery and like you, you can't really walk. They have you walking with a walker that day but it's very painful. Um, and then the first two or three days after that, you're kind of in the same situation where like you're at risk for, you know, the immediate, uh, you know, post-surgery infection and all that kind of stuff. So like wound care and making sure that you're not, uh, you know, you're resting more than you're walking, but you have to walk uh, a couple of minutes every hour. Um, and then at the two or three week mark, you start to open up the physical therapy options a little bit more. And, um, you know, that's kind of the phase that I'm in right now is just really focusing on all the physical therapy on doing the things that I can do with my upper body, uh, integrating some lower body stuff, but, um, trying to be mindful that like, Hey, just because I feel a little bit good right now, I don't want to feel a lot of it bad in a couple of weeks. Right. Yeah. What, what you were saying before, man, like, you know, this decision and going through this, like putting into perspective, those other decisions, you know, I, I slack myself all these quotes all the time. The bigger dragon you slay, the easier it is to slay the next dragon. Like it's, it's, you know, it's combating those big, big things just puts into perspective that like, Hey, I can tackle all these other things. Like I can, I dealt with this over here. Like, why are all these little things? It almost like gives you the, the earned confidence, you know, to, to steal that from Jay to go out there and just like, you know, deal with those other things. So that's, that's another cool thing that you found there. Yeah. I, I feel that way a little bit with the business with, you know, over through COVID, but I just want to, I want to acknowledge something. So, you know, adversity strikes you in all different ways. Um, obviously my family, you know, with Ava getting leukemia was a big For deal sure. and I don't wish that upon myself or anybody ever. And I'm sure you don't wish the hip surgery upon yourself or anybody ever. However, um, you get a lot of lessons you could learn through those experiences and I think it takes somebody with an open mind, and I just want to congratulate you because as I'm listening to you talk, you know, when you think about, and this is John McCaskill and the skill from him, he uses this term mental fitness, which I really found uh, compelling because we work so hard to improve our fitness, but I think sometimes we lack on this mental fitness side. I think as you overcome adversity, you earn the confidence, you expose yourself to new things, but you have to be open-minded enough to grow and improve your own mental fitness. And it seems to me, like through this experience, the only reason why I think you're sitting here on the other side saying that it's been, as far as I'm concerned, like all, a good thing for your life is because you made it a good thing for your life. Like you chose to focus on what was in your control and to, to take this as a positive, right. And, and open your mind and improve your mental fitness. And I think you could have gone the complete opposite way. So mm. uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you made the decision to make this a positive in your life. Um, and this doesn't always happen to everybody all the time. And Everybody has all different types of adversity. So I don't want to say that everything's all rainbows and unicorns because it's not. And I'm sure MDV would agree on this. However, if you're going to go through it, what's in your control is how you respond to it. And it sounds like MDV is responding to it in a way that's going to improve his life for the next, you know, five decades to come, which I'm sure. proud of you, man. It, it, this Thank has been you. a great conversation, dude. And it's also one of those things where no matter what the circumstance is, like what is actually going to help solve that circumstance? Like, woe is me or finding the lessons and applying them so that either the circumstance doesn't happen again, or you just like to what MDB said, like net, net, you come out the other side, just a better person closer to where you want to be. Yeah. No, I mean, the situation is just a situation. You can't, as That's much it. as you want to try, you cannot change the situation. Like the, the event happens whatever the event is, whether it's, you know, uh, you, you, you break up or, you know, you have an injury or a setback or whatever, like it's not going to change the fact that this thing happened, but like, and I steal all of this stuff from stoic philosophy. I mean, I've been using that for a very, very long time and whether or not, like I was always, 
uh, successful in implementing it. Definitely not. But um, you get the opportunity to frame that thing the way that you want to frame it, right? Like you, you are the person who gets to look at it and be like, oh, I can put a positive spin on this or a negative spin on this. This can, this can be a net positive or this can be a net negative. And um, learning to uh, not only embrace the stuff that like overtly is positive, like there's a lot of stuff that happens in life that everybody experiences that like is positive. And like, that's really easy that you can look at that as a positive, but like also to look at the situations that might <clears throat> historically have been negatives, quote unquote, or like, you know, you'd look at it and be like, oh, wow, that's really shitty. Like, how do you take that and reframe it in your head to be like, okay, yeah, this wasn't ideal, but like, how do, how do I make the most of this? Or how do I look at this in a way that can be beneficial to me? Or like, is this really the worst thing that's ever going to happen in my life? And, you know, I, I think like for me, like there was a long time in which like little shit, <laughs> like really little shit would be like the worst thing that could happen. And it eventually becomes really easy to continue to think about like, oh man, I can't believe this thing happened. Or like, you know, uh, woe is me, or I'm the victim here. And like, you just, you, you give up so much control there. And again, I am not perfect at this. This is just stuff that like, I'm still working on, but like, you have the ability to look at things like an injury and be like, okay, how can this thing benefit me? How can I make this into a positive? And how can I find the other side of this to be better than I was before? And that's, inarguably better in my opinion than looking at it as being like, Oh, wow, this sucks. And now I can't do anything for two years and uh, fuck it. I'll just see what happens. Well, like when I get the surgery and I'm, I'm just going to eat like shit or I'm just never going to be um, active or I'm whatever, you know, and th those are the easier routes sometimes. Well, MDV, I know uh, we're coming up on an hour here. I just want to say, man, this has been a, a, a great conversation. I think for anyone who's going through something i think there's a lot of wisdom that you're they're releasing and i know and I, I mean dude you're you're practicing it like i know you've been reading the stoic for forever and it sounds like now like certain things are clicking it just takes time dude like a lot of these things just take time um but i like the idea of you know making decisions making the decisions you know you need to make to feel the way you want to feel like i i just i think that's super powerful and it's a good reminder for me with 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 the way my body feels so i appreciate it um gabe any kind of final remarks for mr mdv no, man, I appreciate you jumping on. This is something that, you know, we've obviously talked about quite a bit, but um, I think that a lot of people can get a lot from listening to this because we're all dealing with something. You never know what people are dealing with, but we're all dealing with something. So appreciate you, man. Hell yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. Make sure to hit up MDV. If you're going through the particular hip, um, not to volunteer MDV, but a little bit, uh, you know, if you're going through some type of similar struggle, I'm sure he'll love to talk to you about it. Uh, MDV, where what's the best place? Instagram, you think? DM or? Yeah, I'm not... Um... You know, I, I I kind of am reframing how I'm looking at social media a little bit. So I'm still uh, on there to contact people who I uh, have relationships with, but at MDV underscore FIT, I have um, a channel there. I also have a podcast. It's called The Intro, an unfiltered fitness podcast. It's brought to you by the NC Fit Network. That podcast is really doing very well. I have a lot of conversations on there with my buddies, James Hobart and Max Isaac. They're two of the best coaches in the world in the functional training space. And we have a lot of fun on that show. So if you want to check it out, we're 135 episodes deep, which is kind of crazy. That's awesome. Uh, and super stoked if you guys want to check it out. Well, sounds good, brother. Well, hey, thank you everyone for tuning in. Make sure to leave us a rating, a review. Keep training hard. Keep getting after it. See you again next week. Let's go. Let's go.